there's a, a belief or a saying that teachers should be fulfilled not by monetary gains, but by their passion for the community and their teaching and profession. And to us, that's a little bit crazy because for all passions, you want to be able to live off of that passion. I went to Morgan State in Baltimore for about three years. Did not get my degree. Had a great time. Did not get my degree. Got a lot of debt though. So I, I bought the most expensive Vegas tickets. I went down with $5,000 and single, and I came back with not $5,000 and still single. I literally told to my face that I'm not a man because I don't have a place of my own. That impacted me and it stuck with me. So I definitely got the apartment immediately and paying a little bit outside my means right now. Good morning. My name is Bram McKay Davis. I'm a teacher from Silver Spring, Maryland. And money to me is essentially freedom to enjoy what you want, freedom to do what you need to, freedom from fear, persecution, and essentially giving you uh, opportunity to just live. Brandon, welcome to the podcast. I love how you have clarity around the purpose of money. It, it's a tool that in itself may not mean much, but it frees you up to pursue things that really are important to you. What do you do, Brand? I'm a teacher, middle school, reading English. That's interesting. I have been meaning to see if a teacher will come to my podcast because I've heard such, such an interesting thing about this profession in itself. And mm -hmm. I, I'll use this opportunity to quickly check with you, somebody who is a practitioner. A couple of things. One I've heard is that majority of folks think that teachers don't get really paid enough for the kind of effort they put in. But at the same time, there is this other thinking which feels that teachers have it easy. They don't really work a full 8-hour, 10-hour shift like others. Then there are summers when teachers don't work at all. Is that true? And it is more important in this financial perspective because people think that teachers should always be doing something of a second job or a side gig because of the nature of their job. What is your perspective on that? So that's actually a really good question. To answer in two parts, there's a, a belief or a saying that teachers should be fulfilled not by monetary gains, but by their passion for the community and their teaching and profession. And to us, that's a little bit crazy because for all passions, you want to be able to live off of that passion. Especially when we go to school, get degrees, some of us two or three degrees to be in this classroom only to have to now find other means of income. That being said, we have summers off, yes, but we have to make a choice. Option one is we get our pay spread out all 12 months. Our paychecks might look a little bit less than what we would expect for a $60,000, $70,000 income, but we will get paid all 12 months, even the two to three were off for the summertime. The other option, mind you, is we get paid for the months we work, but we don't get paid for the ones we don't. So let's say July, June, August, we don't work those summers, we get no income from that time. If you're great with your money, can plan well and budget properly, you might be okay. But for a majority of us, at least from my experience, it's hard to just live off of money we had saved or had held at two months, three months possibly of no incoming money. So a lot of us have to find summer jobs, summer gigs, things to get an income coming because we know we're not going to get anything else during that time. That's very interesting. And, and thanks for bringing that clarity. What I gathered is that, uh, first of all, you do have summers off, but as teachers, you're not get, getting paid at all for those times. You may have an option to spread your 10-month salary to 12 months or whatever, but that's more of a payment plan. So that's one a sombering reality that our teachers don't get paid for two, two to three months of the year, which is yeah. which can make anybody's life difficult. But at the same time, one has to play the cards that you are dealt you can look at it more like an opportunity that you do have of those few months to do something. But then the problem is, what do you do that can fill your full time for those two, three months, but then you're back to your regular job. So you cannot no longer focus on that. That I'm sure is very difficult. Uh, have you found anything that you have been able to productively do and do it consistently? So for a long time now, maybe since I was about 22, I've been lifeguarding. I'm about 32 now. Wow. Uh, but I've been lifeguarding, pool management, swim lessons. Actually, teaching swim lessons got me into teaching full-time English. But as I became older, especially in my 30s, I'm like, am I supposed to be at a pool? Should I be looking for gaining full employment that will progress me professionally or impact 
my livelihood beyond just a, a measly paycheck here and there. So for the last year or so, I've stopped doing lifeguarding, pool management as a side gig, which was pretty good money. In efforts to find summer jobs or side jobs that connected with my degree, with my profession, with my actual adult life, opposed to just getting money here and there, if that makes sense. It does. It does. So this teacher situation lends itself well to seasonal jobs. And you did well by finding a seasonal job that kind of is available in summers because most of the other traditional seasonal jobs are available during holidays and all when you don't have enough time. But more sustainable would be something which either you're bringing in money or you're learning some skills during those times. But then you can use those skills throughout the year working part-time to still bring some money, right? Those are some suggestions for teachers. But for now, uh, Brandon, what kind of income you are bringing in? And is this only from your teaching job? So yes, my teaching job right now, I'm making uh, 70000 That's as of this school year, 2023. And while I have seen a slight bump, because I have chosen the 12-month option to ensure I have some kind of income over the summer, I'm still not seeing a grand difference in my three-month-ago paychecks to my paychecks now. And that's been a little bit difficult. I've been trying to find side jobs that align, again, to my profession, but I might be in the boat of taking anything to ensure I'm, I'm stable above water. Yeah, okay. I recently did a video for my channel where I was talking about jobs for college kids, frankly, uh, because I was talking about side jobs while you're studying full-time. Uh, it, because let's accept it, the college kids, they don't really study all the time. Right? <laughs> They're out having fun. So I said, if you want, you can actually earn some money. And I made a video about it. So one of the things mentioned in that video was about writing, being a writer. Or it's a creative job. You like being an English teacher. I think this will come naturally to you. There's a lot of demand nowadays, writing in different areas. And it is now evolved into two ways. First, it was pure writing, writing blogs, writing articles, writing scripts. Now, I know that AI has come and a lot of people are talking about, hey, who needs human? You tell AI to write and it will write anything, <laughs> which is partially true. And I'm sure you're starting to see it. Even it will start your writing your lesson plans for you. <laughs> but as of now, at least, AI does need some human intervention. So I've seen smart people not pretending as if AI does not exist. But what they're saying is, hey, I am, say, an English teacher. So you have that authority. You can say, I can look at the AI scripts and I can make sure that they look more human. So I can bring that human elements of it. And that kind of jobs are also very much in demand. Because if you say, I'll write your script, people say, no, I'll just get it done from AI. But you tell them that AI scripts will never or AI articles will sound very phony and people see through it. Then sometimes they frankly write such things which a human will never say, but AI yeah, doesn't care. It will, if you find somewhere in Google, it will just say it. So you do want a human not only to review it, but humanize it, if that right. makes sense. So that's something which you can consider. And there are various platforms. I talk about those in my video as well. I'll share a link on the, put it in this video as well. But that's something which teachers can definitely look at, as well as college students. Okay, great. So now, based on this 70K income, uh, is this gross? Uh, because I know that teachers do have a lot of benefits, but I don't know how much benefits are outside of this and how much of benefits you still have to take as a deduction from your salary. Uh, yes. So with gross, I have right here actually. With gross, because no insurances and things like that, I'm more at about just about 65-ish. Okay. A little bit lower than that. So what you're saying is more like net. So gross maybe 70, and then you have certain deductions, and then that's what you get. I know yeah. you're not a maths teacher, but an English teacher. <laughs> I don't <laughs> mind that. I don't mind that. <laughs> okay, that's fine. It lends to like, say a 5K or something about a month, roughly. Yeah. But, but then that is still before taxes, or you're saying it's post-taxes, that, that about 5K a month. You still have taxes? Yeah, yeah, I still have state and stuff like that taxes, so it brings down a little bit more. That one I'm not too exact about. I think last time I saw it with taxes involved around 63-ish. Okay, so still close to 5K a month is a fair assumption. That much at least you should be able to bring in. So let's yeah. talk about your major expenses. How is housing situation there in Maryland? <laughs> Where exactly are you in Maryland? So I'm in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is Spring. called uh, part of DMV, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. 
where it's pretty much a tri city ish amalgamation area that's together culturally. Mm-hmm. You look up DMV, you only see either Virginia, Maryland, or DC together. With that being said, I'm very close to DC, and DC is very pricey. Mm-hmm. And with being an extension of DC in some aspects, this part of Maryland can be also pretty pricey because you have access to DC in five minutes. Where I live, I have 15 minutes to the main city area. And that's just without, that's, what, that's, that's by driving. Taking the train to be a lot faster. So that convenience makes things a little bit pricey in this area. Currently, right now, I'm paying with my parking, this is not including utilities, about $16.50 a month on rent. And that's low. Like I, I got one of the lowest in this building because I've got lucky at timing and I got the lowest in this area. I've been looking for some months and 2000 or more is pretty often the, the, the pricing range I would see. Finding 1650 uh, without utilities by itself was pretty good. I have to agree. Again, given the location that you mentioned, I am in Atlanta and I know that kind of rent is difficult to find a good area even in Atlanta. And DC is definitely costlier than Atlanta. So really, I've been lucky. But with rent, the challenge is that you never know when your luck will run out. So unless you have some rent protection or something, it's very difficult. They can come around and increase your rents next yes. time it's time to renew. And one of the inconveniences, conveniences of getting this cheap um, place that I have now, I don't have my own utilities. I have, I think the word is called joint utilities, where me and five others on the floor share a median of electric, light, and gas. So... When I first got here, a couple of my page, my rents was like eighteen fifty, something like that. But most recently, I've been playing close to two thousand because of was getting cold. So folks using heat, I don't use but so much heat to make sure I don't spend so much money. But because it's not only on me, I don't really have a guess on every month what it's going to be. I could be sixteen ninety five, I could be nineteen eighty, and that's also a problem with where I'm at, which might lead to me leaving here next year. But yeah, that the inconsistency of the rent expectation, especially without being in my control, is also pretty hard. I agree. Rent itself is not in your control and then you're in the situation. For folks who don't know this, it's pretty common though in apartments and all where uh, the owner will get one bill for the full apartment and if there are multiple, if they don't have separate meters for individual units, they will just split it across the units pretty much equally. And then that's what Brandon's situation is. So again, that's lack of control. But that's a pretty significant portion of your income, which is going in rent. And then if you include utilities and all, like you said, about 2000 so out of 5000 if you're paying 2000 that's about 40% of your income going in rent, which is pretty high. Okay, for your area, I don't think you have an option, but, but that sort of lends itself to very much less money left for other things. What about your car situation? Do you have a car payment as well? So thankfully, last year, I had uh, finished paying off my car. So it's officially mine. I have a 2014 Mazda 3 manual stick shift. I love stick shift. But I've been having issues maybe three months after paying it off on and off. I had sliding on the road because something had disconnected from something. And I get that fixed. Right now, I think my clutch has burned out of nowhere because I had it looked at maybe a month ago and it was fine. So I get that fixed. Right now, I'm carless until it gets fixed. I've had the engine blow out on me. I've had so many things happen since having the expense of car payments be gone that I'm essentially still paying car payments on the... On repairs, rather, right? No. The same thing. Right. right. Yeah. And then uh, that's unfortunate because 2014 is not that old a car. I don't know why it's troubling you so much. I drive a 2011 Honda CRV, and it, that is pretty well. One reason is that I don't drive it too much. I have flexibility. I don't need to drive so much. So that's maybe a reason why my car is okay. But 2014 is not too old either. One thing that is advisable for anybody who has paid off their cars, which I must commend you for doing that. Very few people take it to a logical conclusion, which is paying off the car loan. They just trade it before it's done and then they have another payment. But what you need to do is you should continue. You had a car payment. This is general advice. As soon as you pay off your car, you should still continue to have that car payment. Just pay it to yourself, but put it in a separate account. Because 
car is something which sooner or later you're going to run into trouble and you are going to need a car. And rather than taking a much bigger loan next time, you need to have some sort of savings so that you can trade in or sell this car and then still bring in some money to the table so that the next loan, best case scenario is you don't have to get a car loan ever again. But that's best case scenario. If you are able to take this paid off car and run it for five, seven years, eight years, Maybe you will save enough to get the next car. But that's a best case scenario. And that's how it should be. But even otherwise, you will at least have a smaller payment next time you go for a car. If you are still repairing your car and if you think that post these repairs, the car would be okay and it can run for a while, my suggestion would be to start paying yourself and start saving for the next car. This is something, again, a lot of us don't think about. And one day this expense will hit us. And at that point, we'll feel like, oh my God, there is no option. I have to take this $30,000 loan because that's my only option to get a car. <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad that you don't have a car payment now. right? But car repairs have been some expense. So can we still put down some amount as your regular car expense per month, be it repairs plus fuel and all? Maybe that's, that's low ball because like all the time. Maybe, like, maybe like 150, 200. I'm going like gas, things like that. and Yeah. That's nice. Well, on average, yes. It's a that's good. What about your food expenses? Because that's the third category, major category. Do you get any sort of benefit or you have access to any sort of subsidized food, food items or not? Nothing like that? Nope. It's all me. I, I, have, the, I have the apps. Get a little discount. So the reason I said is, again, because yeah. of the school. That's what I said. That at times, there are lunches available and some part of the day, you may not have all the meals, but some meals which are at certain subsidized rate. I don't know if that is available to you. That's what I meant, actually. Um, not, not that I'm aware of. I know we have things for students in place. I've never really asked if those things apply to us as well. I'm not sure, to be honest. And I have also seen in my child school, at one time I went there, and my impression was that there are good nutritious lunches available for, so teachers will also eat. But I saw most of the teachers had their own lunch also. So that also te- uh, tells me that they found it both nutritious as well as maybe cheaper to bring their own food rather than buying the food all the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I try to make, if I cook some for dinner, I try to have a little extra for lunch the next day if, if I can. But uh, that's that's my model pretty much. Okay. So what what would be your expenses on food? That's a great question. I'm still trying to master, get better at that. If I go to the grocery store, like, I usually don't go to like I need to, like I've, I've I bought 20 things. Now I've used 18 of those things. So, okay, I have to go now. And when I go, I may pay in the range of, on average, 70 to maybe close to $100 if I'm buying most of the things I need at one time. But I spread those out if I can. So I won't buy every two weeks. I might buy once a month to do a big grocery store buy and maybe tiny things here or there. I'm going to say 75 to 100 That's the point? Because I take it that you're shopping just for yourself, right? Not for your family yeah. or anybody else. You're staying yeah. alone. But still, $100 is quite cheap, actually, for a month worth of groceries. Unless you're doing too much eating out. Do you I'm, I'm trying to stop that. That's <laughs> just, it's definitely dwindled in the last month or so. <laughs> but yeah. Otherwise, you have been doing doing that quite often, right? Yeah. You would agree? Okay. There was a time where us teachers would get together every payday. And get some food together, drink things like that. And I realized I can't be part of that all the time because we were having so much fun. Oh, yeah, fun. How much did I spend on food? And, oh, wow. It was fun. We're having fun. We're having a good time. Then a month later, it's, oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. And I know I keep talking about my other videos, but the, another video that I made was, do I really need to get rid of my spendy friends? <laughs> because at times, you feel pressured. Everyone is going out. You probably would say yes. And then, it, if it is good time with friends, that's great. But it generally, that's our culture and it's influenced by businesses and everything. Is that the only way to have good time is go have drinks. And the problem with that is you end up spending so much money on drinks, more than food. <laughs> Mostly. Somehow, this perception has been made that you can only have good times with friends over drinks. <laughs> the same drinks if you buy from, say, a grocery store. Even if you want to consume some alcohol, bring at home and... Just drink, maybe even invite a friend. It'll be much, much cheaper. But the culture is that you go to a pub and then tip and then drink and then <laughs> and have a good time. But I don't know why that is a good time. You're still watching the same T 
TV which is available at home, having the same drinks which you can drink at home. Just have friends over at home. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 this new apartment I have for right now, like I'm, I'm gonna be a host. You gotta have a little area and just have folks over. It's the same experience, same friends as you said. It's just one, you're more control of the space, and two, you're not spending money every five seconds. <laughs> yeah, that's how it should be. Uh, so even if we put some miscellaneous expense, which we all have, like it comes to about three thousand dollars a month as your expenses, which you absolutely have to, right? Now. On paper, you have some money left. I want to understand, do, do, are you using this money for savings? Do you really have that money left? Or you have debt that you have to take care of and most of this money is going towards that debt? So it's a mixture. I was saving for a time and I'll explain what happened to that in a minute. But right now, the bigger thing is the debt. They started doing the repayments on student loans where I still have about 40000 because I have my master's as part of that. So about 40000 left in student loans. I have credit card debt because during COVID time, I thought, let me get a credit card, build my credit and build. And then things started getting weird. So now I have a credit card that I can't touch anymore because it's definitely beyond its means. And then I have a another credit line with PayPal that I forget about because I couldn't pay at the time. I'm still paying it now. I just called me yesterday about a payment. I got to pay by Monday. So they're going to take out my account on Monday. And you know, a lot of things like that. The student loan one was the biggest one that came back, but the other debts are also weighing on me as well. I, I paid a minimum. And of course, as we know, paying a minimum kind of long. Yeah. Correct. So paying a minimum is actually risky. But let's go over them one by one. The student loan, you say 40K balance. How much did you actually start with? Well, when I first started paying, because huh, I had... As you mentioned earlier about student college not studying but so much, I went to Morgan State in Baltimore for about three years. Did not get my degree. Had a great time. Did not get my degree. Got a lot of debt, though. After that, I did some soul searching, eventually went to Bowie State and got my bachelor's and eventually master's. So I had debt from Morgan State, the college I didn't go to. I went to a community college for a year or two, so I was paying that. But that was like more out of pocket immediately, so I couldn't pay my previous debt at the time. So I sat. And then with Bowie State getting more loans, it kind of just came together. I think at one point, all together, it was like close to 70-something thousand, maybe, maybe six, yeah, 70 or 60-something thousand, something like that. I know whatever it was at, I had brought it down to now it being 40,000. That's so maybe it can already paid, paid uh, yeah. 30K of that debt. But I found it interesting. What happened to your first college? You say you got debt, but you didn't get a degree. Yeah, so I went to Morgan State, and this is the time where I didn't know <clears throat> what I was doing. I come from a Caribbean background family. Family was Jamaican, came here, made a life. Everyone's going to do their best. Great love, great support, but also you're going to college. No question, you're going to college. So I always knew I was going, but you could not ask me what I was going to do because I, I had no idea. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm just saying the buzzwords. I had no idea what my actual path was. At the time, I did business marketing because I had a friend who wanted to run a business and that was his best friend. And I was like, hey, I'll support you, bro. So I basically chose a degree based on someone else. So obviously, I wasn't really passionate. I wasn't there for the right reasons. I went to class when I really had to and then not more. I had good times and bad times, but more good than bad. Overall, I was not going to class. I was not passing class. I passed English. I passed all English classes always, but beyond that, I was not doing well. By the third year, my mom was like, you're, you're coming out. That's it. You're done. That's it. Come back home. That's done. And I, I really couldn't fight her. Yeah. After three years, I have what? Three, four past classes. Yeah, you're right. That's <laughs> but I still have to pay for those classes. I, I, I had math classes I never took. I had science classes that confused me. Or they confused me because I didn't want to focus on them. I wasn't passionate, but either way, I was confused. So I, I took all these classes that I had to pay for whether I passed or not. And when I left the school, my mindset was, oh, it's, it's gone now. I ain't passed. It's whatever. But I was always there. And uh, yeah, so I gained experience. I gained memories. And I gained debt. And that's an interesting way to put it. And I'm glad that you're, A, you're putting a brief face to it. But I'm more thankful and glad that Eventually, you said you did some soul searching, but you eventually found your path and you actually completed college. So at least now you have a debt, but 
it may maybe not all of it helped, but eventually you completed college. So your story has a happy ending. But there are many others who actually do exactly what you said. Just go to a college just for the sake of it without knowing how it is going to help. And right, and is this at times selecting what they are going to study without any thought given to how this is going to help them in their life. They pick up something which they are not passionate about or something which they are passionate about, but there is no real logical path to how they will earn their living from that. Yeah. Right. But students should do that before taking on debt in particular. If you're going to community college, at least there is a chance that you'll not like it, you'll drop off, but no harm done apart from the time lost. Here you end up with a debt. Okay. So you have that and you have, looks like you have been paying it very seriously. How much monthly you have to pay now that the payment self started again? Initially, I started off with about three seventy-five a month. I am still in the works, but hopefully, I can get it down to about hundred less, about two seventy-five. With the history of me paying and then me being a teacher, I'm trying to bring it down to that. But yeah, currently, it's about three seventy-five. Okay. Um. Like I, you told me what you have credit card debt, and we'll talk about those debt in a minute. But tell me this: Have you been prioritizing repaying the student loan debt over anything, everything else? Would you say when I had first started my professional teaching, I had my certification teaching career in 2017, because I had went from lifeguard pay to now this salary pay, I was thinking oh, I need to do better and actively bring this debt down now that I've found myself in a place of more profit. So for a couple of years from 2017 to right before COVID hit in 2020, I was making a grand effort to pay. And there's even times where I would call outside of my date of pay to give an extra amount to bring it down faster. My, my mindset was this is a grand Debt weight on my life. I'm gonna try to bring it down as much as I can. A, B, C, and D. I'm I was, time still living at home. I have too many expenses. Let me give money here and bring it down. It's good to make that effort. And and if you are actively seeking to bring your debt down, that's commendable. What I want to know is at that point, did you have any other debt, like credit card debt or any other personal debt? At that time, it was still my car. So it was my car payment debts. It was that, and then. But not credit card. Not at that. Okay, no. So, but now you have credit card debt, right? Yes, now I do. Okay, but I heard you saying that I'm paying only minimum of on my credit card. Yes. Are you paying minimum on your student loan as well? Would you say? I'm trying to bring it down so that I can. Like I said, I'll try to bring it to two seventy five, opposed to the now three seventy five. With that, you be an option. I'm assuming they can go lower, but I don't know if that's the lowest amount. Did they ask me how much I could? I was like, maybe this amount, 300, I'll keep you 275. And I'm not sure that's the lowest amount, but that's the amount that at that time we had worked to because they wanted to charge me a little bit close to 500. But I brought them down to 375. I think you should negotiate more and mm. try to bring it down further. Mm. Uh, definitely, you want to pay down all your debt. It's an obligation that you have. And student loan in particular, as we know, even if you go through bankruptcy, it never leaves you. So it has to be paid. Having said that, what I've seen is that many people somehow just don't like that student debt. I'm talking about folks who are responsible financially, uh, which looks like you are. Uh, they really want to get rid of that student debt. It, it weighs them down, right? It feels like I have such a big debt. But at the same time, they have other high interest loans like credit card debt or personal loans. And they are able to live with that, but not with the student loan. Whereas what you need to decide is what is priority. Student loan typically is at a much lower rate and there you have some flexibility. Uh, it will def definitely not be at the same rate as credit card or personal loans and all. Uh, the interest that you are paying over there. So I know there is some math that gets introduced. But because it's lower rate, theoretically speaking or practically speaking rather, you need to focus on paying down the debt that has the highest interest rate. So even within your credit card and on, you should look at, is PayPal charging me more or is my Wells Fargo card charging me more? That should be your first priority rather than spreading your money equally across all debts because all debts are not created equal. Okay. So my suggestion is look at your debt, 
look at the interest rates being charged and see which one should you attack first. So even if you're paying minimum on others, see all your extra money should go towards that one debt which is charging you the highest interest rate. Then financially that makes more sense. So don't go by the psychological aspect of it's a big loan, it's 70k or 60k and this is just 5k. But this 5k may be troubling you more because of the interest that they are charging you. So you may need to prioritize the 5k over 60k. Give it some thought. You know, that, that's just a fair thought because I've watched as these lesser loans have definitely multiplied or grown more exponentially than the other one has. As you said, I think psychologically, even as like humans, oh, big danger, deal with the big danger, not the small one. So, yeah. no, I, yeah. that- I think it is big, but it, it's friendly. It's it's more like in any time. <laughs> it's friendly. <laughs> Don't worry about it so much. As, as long as you have these other things which are more uh, troubling you more. So now... Tell me about your credit card debt. How, how did you end up uh, maximizing your credit card? At that time, didn't you uh, have the job? I got a Capital One card. This is me. This is during COVID time, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2021. I actually got it in an effort to improve my credit more. I was trying to improve my credit, try to be able to gain access to more money while I'm stuck home, trying to better myself in some fashions. Once things start opening up more, and um, I was looking to purchase things and use the card. I misjudged my ability to pay back what I had on the card. And I remember at the time I started using the card, it was close to the holiday. I have a big family. I love my family. We love each other. All support, all the greatness. It's amazing. But we always spend Christmas together. My mom, her sister, my grandparents. And the cousins, it's usually about 15, 16, my good day, 17 bit of us together. And I'm changing that now, but I used to be, or I am still, but I'm a big gift person. I like to give, appreciate those I care about you. I want to show you that. One of my love languages is, is gifting gifts, right? I would always try to get things for these people, especially now at this time, good job, getting paid more. Let me get gifts that show you my family, like I'm, I'm an adult more so. and Younger cousins, I want to show uncle so and so is awesome and, and things like that. And then that kind of just invited a grand storm of purchasing without preparing for going forward. So things would be going out and the timing coming in would not be fast enough. And then, of course, I got introduced to apps such as Earnin, where you can get access to some money in advance. And that kind of Messed up my timing for like about a month or two, depending on what was going on. Paying my back off stuff that one time a year, Amazon payment at the beginning of the year, this, that, things that came all together at the top of the year, I had been behind and me thinking, oh, it's a small thing. I'll come back to that. Let me take care of these things. Duh. I'm starting my master's classes soon. So I got to put money there. And let me, let me focus on this. I'll come back to that. And I didn't come back to it fast enough. Or I allowed myself to forget about it. Or I chose to let it go to my subconscious. Either way, it wasn't a priority. And now it's become a little tiny thing monster to a good pocket size. Coming at me. It's coming. So tell me this. You took the credit card in order to build your credit. But what impact did it have finally on your credit? Initially, it did improve my credit. It definitely improved my credit. Right now, it's not doing the best. It's not doing great for me. It's not I've nosedive, but the points I've worked hard to gain in the last year or so, they've definitely gone. So that's one mistake. Again, our financial industry generally preys on people who do not have financial literacy. We may be, like you said, masters, PhD in everything and leading a good life, but financial literacy is like different, particularly the complex way our financial system is organized. So things are presented as building your credit by taking a credit card, which is true, though. You need to ha- show responsible behavior around credit. But it's such a double-edged sword that handing over credit to a card to somebody, like, they will give it to college kids and say, you need to start building your credits quickly. This guy doesn't understand anything and they will start spending on the card and they will spoil their credit for life. Right? But that's how it is presented. Same for you spoke about those apps which show as if they are making it convenient or points. You can win points by using credit cards and use these points for a free air travel or this and that. And 
everyone will say, I am using this card for points because anyway, I have to make those expenses. What you don't understand is that nobody, nothing is for free. If the credit card company is giving points, they know that I'll have to give points to 5% of the people, but other 95% will run behind and they will pay fines and penalties and interest, which will pay for points and then some. Right. So it's, a, it's always challenging. I really advise people to not go for credit card either for uh, any purpose, like particularly points and all. It's very, very risky. For some one one time discount, you go to a shop, Target, and they will say you take this store credit card and you get 50% discount on this purchase. And people are so excited. They understand that this credit card is going to stay with you for life. So don't just sign up for credit just like that. And the other thing which looks like happened to you also is things like PayPal credit or you buy checkout for Amazon and there is a, a thing which says you can pay it over time, right? People being extra helpful saying you purchase it and don't worry about it. Take it on credit, pay it over time, <laughs> right? That's so risky. <laughs> it comes in the guise of helping you. But like I said, there is no helping. They're doing it because they have calculated that certain percentage of people, which is very high typically end up not being able to pay it back. Even if they think that, yeah, rather than spending 500 now, I will rather pay it after five months. PayPal is giving it for free. Nothing is free. PayPal knows that so many people will not be able to pay. Life will happen. And then you will start paying interest and fees. Is that what happened with you as well? Literally. Exactly that. <laughs> exactly that. And yeah, the thought was to get something now and take care of it later. And then over time, it just... You gain a big, a bigger expense than I expected it to. And going forward, anything that I'm trying to purchase big like that would just be immediate, one time. The, the thought of paying the future is unpredictable for yourself, for anything, for the universe. You have no idea. So, yeah, I'm going to, I would advise past me to definitely not do something like that again. And going forward, future me is not looking for any extended payment options going forward. Absolutely. Okay. You are also telling me about some Vegas trip that you did, which you don't yeah. look so fondly back on, financially speaking. What happened there? What uh, this, is, this is uh, 21, maybe 22, but I want to say 2021. And this is post-COVID. I've, I've been saving. I, I've been doing good for a time. I promise I was. I was doing good. I was saving money. I had some money in my savings, a grand amount, actually. And I'm part of this friend group. And... Like every sitcom tells you shouldn't. I had dated one of the friends in the friend group. She and I dated for a time. It ended poorly because of we broke up around Christmas. So that wasn't grand. And then blah, 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 life happens. But we're still in the same friend group. So it's like we can't not interact. It's here, blah, blah, blah. In that romantics, feelings are still there, obviously. Oh, we shouldn't. We shouldn't do this again. It didn't work out, blah, 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 this and that. Her birthday is in... March, so we go. She wanted to do his big birthday trip to Vegas, the whole friend group. So we're going, right? You should go. I knew about this trip for months prior to our breakup. So after the breakup, I'm like, I don't think I should go anymore. I don't want to go anymore, dude. Uh, around this time, we have been interacting some. I had the feeling like there's something still here. We can make it work. I can show her how committed I am by going with them to Vegas. It's the Vegas. I have the money for it. It's fine. I can make it happen. Buy the Vegas tickets late because I made this choice later than everybody else did. So I, I bought the most expensive Vegas tickets, fight tickets. Had to contribute to staying in a hotel, which I I believe was a Balenciaga. Big, big hotel. We all stayed in one room, but big hotel, big pricing. Even that one room was pretty pricey. She wanted to go to the most fanciest steakhouse in the casino. So that was definitely pricey. She's traditional, so of course I paid for her. Oh, we're not together, but I'll take care of her. She's traditional. I got her back. We're, we're friends. I'll take care of her. It's fine. She got the what kind of steak? It's fine. Wagyu, Wagyu. It's fine. I'll take care of her steak. It's cool. I'll take care of it. We go gambling for a couple hours. I'm like, I'm not good at this. So I'm not going to try it. My friends make money. I'm like, I can make money too. I made not one cent, sir. I made not one ounce of, of income during any of that gambling. And then on the party day, going to the club, I'm not a club person, but she is. So the club for her birthday, she's trying to figure out how to pay for the table, which costs about $2,000. And she's frantic. And of course, I want to be a superhero. So I paid for the table. And I paid for the bottle, sir. 
because I'm the hero who's going to show her that I could be the man she needs me to be. So I went down with $5,000, essentially. And there was no commitment, right? If it, was one, it is one thing if there was a committed relationship, but this was you just anticipating. I went down with $5,000 and single, and I came back with not $5,000 and still single. <laughs> so, well, and we even talked out there, so I don't think so. This is after I've done all these payments. Not to say that the payments should equivocally equal us being together. But even after that happened, there was no even kind of like an inkling of A, B, C, and D, which is like entirely on me. I, I expected, I hope, I allowed myself to sit in some fantasy that wasn't even projected to be that. And so now this kind of sit and stew in it, which I did. And uh, again, yeah, that was a time where I, I really allowed myself, my wants, my dreams to take over any rational thought. Because I'm out here living in Vegas. What the means to live in Vegas? Like I don't have to come back home and live. <laughs> And honestly, I don't know what the plan was if it did work out. Okay, you know, come back with a girlfriend and I'm broke. So I don't know what my plan was, to be honest. I can't tell you. Like you <laughs> said, you're not thinking rationally. And a um, lot of us are in the same situation. Like when it comes to those romantic approaches and all, we don't think rationally. But financially speaking, uh, you need to be careful and not go overboard. Uh, you, I like how you put it that even if it were to work out, that money go, was going to be for two of you. Why to waste it, quote unquote, right? Or yeah. splurge it like that. That's not a good move. And frankly, if there is a partner who is a responsible partner who's looking at you seriously, I expect that partner to caution you and not let you go overboard in spending money. Tell me this. Was this the only time where you let your either feeling or emotions for either a partner or relatives or friends uh, impact you financially or were there other times as well? There were times in the past, in the dating world, I'm like, oh, the expectation is men pay for everything, so I have to make sure I pay for everything. So there are a lot of times where I'd be going outside my means on dates and outings. I remember one time, uh, I have exact amount of money, how much my meal and her possible meal would cost. I would get something small. She might get three things that would be good. And then she got like, five things. I was like, oh, crap. I really, literally could not pay for the meal, like, could you help me pay for this? And that was the whole situation there, too. Yeah, but you were also telling me something about picking up an apartment. Uh, yeah, so the apartment I'm at now is, if I could have waited longer, I might have. And the person that I am currently dating, because of that, prior to now, I've been saving money, this and that. I come from a Caribbean background, so the idea of them with family into your adulthood for a time didn't bother me but so much. The American side of me is I need to get out of here immediately at 18. Caribbean side of me is I have a single mom, a little sister. I'm not living for them, but I can help them out while I get myself together. That's the family way. But this woman being strictly Americanized, you know, no, no external cultural background that she knows of, she's all, man, gotta be this, man, gotta be that, did it. I literally told to my face that I'm not a man because I don't have a place of my own. Literally, I had two degrees. I have a full-time job. But because I don't have an apartment or a place to live outside my mother's house that she got for us, my sister, I'm not a man. And I'm not going to say that statement literally did not break me, but did not impact me tremendously. From that time, and she had given me an ultimatum saying, hey, if you don't have an apartment by so-and-so time, you can't make this happen. I got this apartment literally the three days before that month, three days before the month that she had stipulated in her ultimatum. Mind you, she, has, she had realized it was a little bit much. She apologized. She said she didn't mean it. She was just saying it to say it. But like things like that impacted me and, and stuck with me. So I definitely got the apartment immediately and paying a little bit outside my means right now because as you've heard, my finances aren't the most amazing. <laughs> Every month, depending on the utility, which is why utilities are a problem, utility pricing can impact what my month or my least next two weeks or so might look like. I'm definitely notice that I can be impacted by external forces. Not in like too much of a negative, nefarious sense, but the feelings of those that I truly care about, that I can, that I value their opinion, they impact me some. So, yeah, definitely. And, and that's again human. That's very natural. And then there is a fine line, frankly speaking. Like I was talking about partner being responsible, thoughtful about how you are placed. At times... Partner also has a difficult job if that we are rather had, where as a partner, like 
he or she has to look at you and uh, it's their job to both be supportive but at same be challenging as well i spoke to a gentleman on this chat this podcast and then it's posted he is like in his 40s and still living with his mom and he says my girlfriend lives with her mom and they are okay with it mom is okay with it girlfriend is okay and i was telling that guy hey your girlfriend should tell you that <laughs> same thing <laughs> pretty much she should tell you that you are that if you can't manage it on your own right almost like that because you sometimes you need challenge you need a push you are simply too comfortable is what i told him not applicable in your case your case you are saying that i would have eventually gotten my place but maybe a little extra buffer would help me financially as well why to take this extra expense when i have an option to stay with family for a little longer i'm not married here or not living together here right so it's a balance and I, the only thing that can help in such situation is communication having more open communication with partners again different topic <laughs> but but that i will say so financially speaking partner has a tough job because i expect partners to actually challenge as well so that we take more responsibility as an individual uh, right. of our own so we will we'll see <laughs> at times maybe fear down the line you look back and say maybe i needed that push <laughs> so <laughs> right that's right. possible and I, I don't take that away from it. Like right now, at that moment, it hit me a certain way. And even now, it still hit me a certain way. But at the same time, it's coming from a place of not like maliciousness or, or, or hate. It's, it's someone trying to grow with, mind you, they're still at home as well. But at the same time, man, things, case mind you. But I, I, I try to look at it for what it meant to be, not for how it came off. That makes sense? It does. Okay, great. Are you doing any? You said that uh, you were doing retirement savings, but you have stopped now, or it's getting back. Oh no, I'm doing retirement saving, and right now I'm putting the, the smaller amount, which is about two seventy, and then that just literally just like this last school year, this school year, and I never had savings for retirement before, so I was like, maybe it's time to start. The longer I wait, the less money I'll have, the more I have to work. So I literally started my retirement last year. So is this what they're saying? You're saying is the standard? I think teachers have that, like 401k, they have a 403b, I believe. Right? Yes. That's, yes. Is that what you're referring to? That was me. And, and that's very good. I have done a little bit of reading around it, but I, in, from what I have seen, it's even superior to the regular 401k that everyone else has. So I would... Uh, Strongly encourage make best use of it. Put as much as you can there uh, because that's a facility which is available, frankly, only to teachers and nobody else. So while you take you handle or you take the problems that come with being in the teaching jobs, you should also make best use of the benefits that is available only to teachers. Mm -hmm. So so please uh, do as much as you can and to improve that. I, we already spoke about how you should address your debt. You are. You are a teacher and an intelligent, smart human being. So I'm sure you will address it that way. <laughs> and I, 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 what I meant is that you probably don't need somebody to tell you exactly what to do. But as long as you have a broad guideline, I'm sure you'll make the right decisions for yourself. So th that would be uh, my approach. Anything else, Brandon, which you want to bring up, either want to discuss or tell me where I can help? Yeah. I have to mitigate my impulse buying. And I don't do a bus so often, but I have every few months I'm like, I've been working, I've been focusing on family. I want to enjoy my time. Let me buy this, as you can see the chair, 60 buck video game. And then that 60 bucks could be used for food or for gas or something else like that. And I guess my question is when I find myself, I, I really want this I don't know, anime standee that costs $45, make me happy for a day or two. How do I navigate that headspace? Do I allow myself that, that modicum of like enjoyment, knowing that I'm losing money on the best I could be anywhere helpful to me or my life? Or do I, for the next three weeks, put 20 bucks aside to then get it a month from? So there are uh, two methods. Um, there are many methods, in fact, but this is very common. One is why, what you alluded to towards the end, that we all have certain desire and you cannot just kill your desire completely. Right? You deserve something. One is to plan a little bit. Be, even before you get to spend it, have a very small amount, like $5, $10, $20, whatever you can set aside in, in this fund, which is more of an enjoyment fund. That way, that money is already set aside. And 
that sort of puts a ceiling also how much you can spend. Unless you have really gathered forty five dollars there, you cannot buy that anyway. Right? So that's one natural stop. And once you have done that, it's okay. Spend it if you feel like you you will see that this the this habit of saving aside. Once you start seeing that I have forty, fifty, sixty, it starts giving you you start feeling some joy in that action itself. And you may not even want to spend that money once you have set it aside. You're looking at hundred dollars. You may feel like, hey, it's slowly it's going to become one twenty. So that's one aspect. Right? And even if you spend from there, that puts a ceiling. Second method is, which is generally suggested, is that if you like something, make a f- habit of not buying it for the next 48 hours. That I feel like this is great, but I won't, I will buy it. I, it's in my cart, that's fine, but I just cannot check out because of this policy that I've imposed on myself. I can check out only after 48 hours. Because a lot of those impulses go away, you think you're more saner. Right, and after forty-eight hours, you may decide that ah, maybe I'll do something else. But that's why marketers know this. So everywhere you go, you will see that there is this concept that you need to get the customers to make the buy decision now, because they know that if you think about it, you will likely not buy it. So they'll say that it's going out of stock. It's the last chance. This that. Don't worry about it. Nothing goes out of stock. Everything for a paying customer, things are always available. So don't worry about it. Even a better deal will come tomorrow if you really want it. So don't worry about deal. So that's another method where you spend, uh, wait 48 hours. Finally, there is one more method, which is little advanced, which is says that if you really buy something, you have to figure out, can you buy three of those without impacting your budget? So can you spend three times that amount without having it, uh, it having any impact on your budget? If that is true, then you can go ahead Financially speaking, you can go ahead and make that spend. So if you want a $45, then you need to know, can I spend $135 today without disturbing anything else? That would tell you that you have enough money to b- spend this $45 on without thinking about it, whether you need it or not. So these are different methods that people employ to try and control their impulses and not be not get into what they call as bias remorse, where you buy something and the next day you are like, oh my God, why did I do that? What? Why? <laughs> exactly. You know, I like that last one for sure. The uh, the three times the amount concept. Like also the forty eight hour, but like that plus three amount. I might look into that one more heavily. I like that one a lot, actually. We all are. We all are. And then that's right. why I appreciate somebody like you who is willing to come and talk, have this conversation. Because at times uh, you may not take anything away from the conversation, but just the fact that you yourself are reliving those moments and are able to talk about either a mistake or a problem. That itself is a big win because anybody who's willing to do that, I'm very sure that person will take action on it. So I, I commend you for that. And I appreciate you coming on the call, sharing with all of us. I wish you all the best, Brandon. Thank you. I appreciate the space. Appreciate the space to share and speak that through. So I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thank you.